But in answer to your question, at the end of the thing, um, they're trying to evaluate which of the two poets is better. I mean, Dionysus, the god Dionysus, I'll give it away. He's a god. So how's he going to die? He's got to go on a catabasis. Well, I'm a god already. He goes down there. He's supposed to bring back a good poet. Number one, that is an eloquent statement of the importance of the humanities, okay, to any kind of life at all. Because, I mean, if we're all accountants, not disrespecting accountants, um, radiologists, um, radiographers, if we're all um, truck drivers, you know, what the hell kind of life is that? What are you going to listen to for fun if there's no music? What are you going to listen, you know, read for fun? It, well, I'm preaching again. But basically, they get, okay, let's figure out two artists, two singers that I recognize. They can't be like diggable planets or like any of this other crap because... Uh, I know that, but I'm old. Humor me, okay? That's, no, no, no. There was the Pixies, and then it died. No, uh, because he's coming here, and he's old and bald like me, and therefore no longer relevant. What else you got? Okay. Here's David Bowie. Okay, well, I tell you what. <laughs> okay, and who is the guy who sings the F.U. song? CeeLo Green. Okay, we're going to weigh David Bowie against CeeLo Green. That's not funny. Oh. <laughs> hey, I'm a fatto American. I can do this. I can make fun of people who are overweight because I am one. I don't, I've never seen the guy. I just know that my, my sister, who has a 15-year-old daughter, is horrified. And that's so funny because my sister was so horrifying herself when she was 15. Here's my point. Say, like, all the music you listen to kids nowadays is crap. The CeeLo Green F-U-F-U. And then you had that lady who flipped off the bird during a Madonna Madonna is a multi-million dollar a year into industry. She could be like a small country, you know, doing all of her old songs and stuff like that. I mean, sorry, Madonna. Give it up. She probably does. Let's, <laughs> I'll be here all week, folks. But basically, you're going to weigh the two. And this is the premise, Hunter, okay? And then you got skinny little David Bowie, you know, smoking cigarettes and snorting cocaine. Keep going. Well, I understood the part when they had to say heavy words like uh -huh. that, that the scale would lower, but that didn't it didn't seem like it really compared the two evenly, you know what I mean? Like Well, it's get, it's like respecting, it's like arguing. Do you, have you ever argued about music? With, what who do you argue about music with? Okay, is that your roommate over there? Yeah. Okay, are you enrolled in the class? Yeah. Okay, well good. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you have good roommates. I mean, my brother got along with his roommate for first semester of freshman year, and then they had to be separated before they killed each other. What do you argue about? What is your name? Austin. Austin. Austin, what do you argue about? Um, What's better? I like older music. Like? Like symphony music, and then I like David Bowie stuff. And, and what do you argue about? Well, I like that stuff too, but I like new stuff better too. Okay, so it's new versus old. Aeschylus is probably some shaggy bearded old dude. He looks like this, right? And he talks like this, and where's the next time? Talks like this. Whereas, I'm guessing Euripides, he's got the little stash going. He's got a goat. He's got an earring or two. Nose pierced, eyebrow pierced. Mohawk. You know... Edgy, just edgy as hell. And this guy is, you know, like, bruh, 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 like old guys with beards and mustaches. Everywhere. <laughs> Find your person. Follow your person. Find your place. Versus the I am Missouri State University. 
two completely different styles, two completely different outlooks, two completely different, um, do we have any German speakers here? Weltanschauungen. Two completely different outlooks on life. That's what they're talking about, the difference between. It's not even so much their music or their, in this case, their poetry or their um, plays that they write, okay? It's more like, I'm Aeschylus. I believe that Zeus is completely right about everything, even when he's not. Even when he's like putting the old erotic full Nelson on some punky looking priest or something like that because he is Zeus. And Aeschylus believes that. You know, it's kind of like your grandparents talking about moral decay. Guys getting their noses pierced. Oh my God. And what is your fixation with tattoos? Oh my God. And then the young tattooed dude comes out there busting a move and flashing signs and crap like that. Partially that. But partially, too, is the knowledge as follows. It goes like this. Um, and I said this once to a friend who, she has tattoos. She has piercings. She dyes her hair just weird, bizarre colors because she feels like it. And I said, what would you do if your daughter, you know, who's like 14 now, you know, came home five years from now with a boy who um, had no piercings, no tattoos. His hair is the color it was when he was born. He doesn't dress weird. She would say, I failed in life. I mean, kids are going to do things to make you upset too. But it, my, I guess my answer is, Hunter, are we on? I hope we're on. This is good. Okay, good. Um, the answer is it's kind of a generation gap thing. It's kind of a difference as to the question, should entertainment also have, oh, shoot me, a public affairs mission? I said it. I said the PA word. Aeschylus believes, and we'll get to this, that um, um, drama should be morally uplifting. Even though Aeschylus wrote the play where Prometheus is flipping Zeus off, giving him the two-finger flip off for the reasons I told you about last time. You know, he knows the nymph that is going to bear a son greater than his father, so Zeus has to be monogamous until Prometheus tells him who the chick is that he's not supposed to do anything with. Aeschylus manages to tell that story in a way that still makes Zeus look like the good guy. Aeschylus manages to spin this story in which Zeus is basically doing the right thing only because he's horny. But he was horny in such a great and Zeusly way. It's like if I were to come in here saying, I followed my passion today. Well, I wouldn't do that. That's terrible. <laughs> Disgusting. Report me. Whereas, whereas Euripides is more of the approach that he doesn't want to convince you of how great Zeus is. Um, Euripides is one of these newfangled poets who doesn't want to say Athens is the greatest city that ever lived, that ever existed. Aeschylus is more, I'm sorry, Euripides, the younger poet, is more interested in having female characters in his plays that actually think and behave, I'm about to say it, lay like women. Yeah, exactly. He's going to portray women as having brains and minds that they make up and change from time to time. No, I mean, and Aeschylus has a problem with this. He says, you are making women seem worse than they are. No, I am making them seem like people, like us. So it's that too. Is that an okay answer? Okay, I hope it was. Okay, okay, now it is time for Sierra to hit me with her fine question, her joint question with Taylor. Yeah, I wanted to know, it was uh, Tinius and the Sisyphus, how they tied back into the Okay, and I can answer that. First of all, um, let's use this side of the board here. We have here Ixion, and I can answer this one. And who's the other one? Tidious. Oh, Tidious. 
Well, they're not all perverts. They're just all examples of what in ancient Greek has to do to earn eternal punishment. Um, Ixion is the guy who tried to rape Hera, and he spins round, round, round on a burning ring of fire. Sisyphus is the dude who cheated death and therefore has to roll a rock up a hill for all eternity. Tantalus tried to feed his son Pelops to the gods, so he gets tantalized. Um, Titius tried to put the old erotic full Nelson on Leto, the mother of Artemis and Apollo. The implication is Sierra and Taylor and everybody else that circa 750 BC, the time at which the Iliad and Odyssey were written down, there's still a pretty clear notion. It's the same notion we see in Gilgamesh. And this is a great question. I'm glad you team asked this question. That short of, you know, trying to rape Hera, trying to rape a goddess, feeding your kids to the gods, cheating death, you're going to spend all eternity in that cold, boring afterlife. It doesn't matter, Sierra, if you give all your money away to charity and if um, you die pushing a car out of the way of some wino out on Commercial Street or something like that. You know, it doesn't matter if you are just the most wonderful and kind and you are still going to be spending all eternity next to Thomas the Axe Murderer. You know, as long as you don't murder like gods or something like that. Or... Um, the, whichever of you admitted to being a pervert over there. <laughs> There's really not a whole lot any human being can do to better their lot in eternity. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay, so just as long as you know you don't rape a goddess or feed your kid to the gods or do any of that stuff, at least you're not going to be treading lava for all eternity. The idea that um, hell is a place of punishment of evil is comparatively modern. These guys just don't have it. Okay, Taylor, does that help? Okay, more questions. I'm desperate. Yes, your name is still? I knew that. It seems like Dionysus is afraid to go to Hades. Yeah, and we'll get there in a second. We'll get there in a second um, because he is. But before we get that, um, any other just, he is afraid. Any other random questions about the frogs before I um, uh, uh, overwhelm you with cultural competence? Yes, I'm afraid now, Debbie. Go ahead. Can I send you a picture of cultural No. You are breeding cynicism. You are supposed <laughs> to keep me youthful and uncynical. What's the opposite of cynical? Optimistic. You're supposed to keep me fresh and young and optimistic. Can I ask a question that has nothing to do with that? Sure. Is it wrong that I have a new addition stuck in my head? A new what? A new addition stuck in my head. Yes. Okay. Get help. Okay. okay. It's like these Viagra commercials. If you have an erection, it's lasting for more than four hours. <laughs> okay. All right. I need to, first of all, uh, before addressing Aristophanes' award-winning play, The Frogs. I need to tell you, uh, what do you want first? The fun stuff about the plays themselves, about um, ancient comedies, or the boring stuff, like history? Boring stuff? Okay, so get the boring stuff done first, right? Okay. Many, many years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to tell you where I'm coming, when I was young, when Rich was just a baby, and when your parents were babies, um, we had this thing going on called the Cold War. I, are you familiar with the Cold War? 
the world is divided up as far as we were concerned during the Cold War into two halves. There were the wonderful Americans and the people who love us. We Americans who we worship God and we have democracy and we have capitalism and we risk our lives in the endless struggle against those evil communists. The communists are trying to take over our way of life. They hate us. They're all evil. Even the little baby communists are all evil. They would like nothing better than to come in and drop nuclear bombs on America because they hate us because we're free and they're not. I am of an age where even inside church, the church we went to when I was a kid, there was like a fallout shelter inside the church. And yes, I did have to dive under my desk in second grade <laughs> just in case there was a nuclear attack. Well, yeah, I mean, even in second grade, I wasn't too sure, you know, that this was really going to help. But what it did was it instilled in people my age a mindset that we're never going to get rid of. We can't help it. And meanwhile, while I'm drinking in all of this cultural competence on our side of the planet, um, over in the West, my dear friend, now, Natalia Alexandrovna, my Russian teacher and friend, is growing up as a kid in Stalingrad, Russia, the Soviet Union, where she is forced to wear a gas mask during class every so often with her classmates because those horrible capitalist Americans who oppress Indians and black people and Mexicans and everybody in the world, as a matter of fact, who have this God person who doesn't even exist. They envy us our wonderful lifestyle and our superior morals, and they're going to drop nuclear bombs on us. Basically, the world was divided between East and West. And if you ever... Crips and Jets. Crips and blood, sharks and jets, <laughs> raiders and cowboys, um, Jayhawks and whatever they call the Missouri team. What do they call them? What are the Jayhawkers then? What are the Jayhawkers? KU, Kansas University. Yeah, okay. And Wildcats are the Oh, no, I was thinking about that team up in Columbia, Missouri. What do they call them? Yeah, the Kitty Cats. That's it. Okay. I guess I feel free to disrespect Mizzou every single chance I get. I may not buy into the follow your passion pit place thing, but I really do believe in disrespecting Mizzou every chance I get. <laughs> I, I'm just that wonderful. Look, it's the same way in ancient Greece. And here, Janelle, is your history lesson. Just like little Americans grew up and were taught that Russians are evil communists, just like little Russians grew up and were taught Americans are evil capitalists, and you grow up thinking they're the most evil people in the world, so too did the ancient Greek cities of Athens and Sparta hate each other's guts out. That's essential for an understanding of the play, The Frogs. It wasn't exactly all of Greek history, but for centuries, at least the better part of two centuries, let's see, you had... Uh, It helps when I do this. Here's Athens. Here's Sparta. And they hate each other's guts. Sparta is a big land power. In Sparta, they pride themselves on being ethnically pure. Okay, in Athens, they are the owners of a great big huge naval empire. The Athenians are sailors. The Athenians have holdings even as far, I, I, I drew Greece too big because I also wanted to draw Italy here. But look, I had room. And then we'll draw happy Libya and ancient Egypt and Turkey and my mom. 
Okay, that's the best I can do for you right now. But for about 150 years, these two guys are at each other's throats. It's like watching a gladiatorial contest between a wrestler and an archer. It's like the difference between night and day. In the year 431 B.C., a year which I demand that you not write down, the Athenians and the Greeks went into something called the Peloponnesian War. It was like the ancient Greek version of mm, Civil War, maybe, because in order to have World War, they needed Persians, like a Persian. Um, shiny and new. That joke is older than anybody else in this room. The Spartans and the Athenians got into it over an island. They, they both wanted part of Sicily. So, of course, let's have a great big huge war over here. And it went on for something like 25 years until the Athenians actually got whomped. Now, in the year, <laughs> this will be fun, in the year 417, you don't have to know this number either. I'm trying to make this history. As, have I put Janelle in a coma yet? Okay, now she's shaking her head no. Okay, the Greeks were going to, the Athenians were going to send this big, huge fleet over to Sicily to kick the Spartans out once and for all. The admiral of the fleet was this dude by the name of Alcibiades. Not going to put him on the test either. He's kind of a hero of mine because he's a wild and crazy guy. He was the admiral. He was about 35 years old, but he was just the real deal. And he was a party animal. On the night before the whole dang Athenian expedition of 417, he's going to come over to the island of Sicily and kick the dang Spartans out of there. Alcibiades throws a party. He's got his buddies there. He's got dancing girls there, you know. And after they get all nice and loaded, they go and break the doogies off the herms. I will now draw a herm. It is an anatomically correct statue of Hermes. <laughs> Rich, you can like blur this out, okay? that just about every Athenian had in front of their house. Pardon? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, they were carved not of stone. So, you know, and everybody had them. It was kind of like a statue that you have in your front yard. You say, honey, I just don't like the herm. Our neighbors next door have a bigger herm than we have. All right. So I have to go to the herm market and come back with the... 14-inch model, or whatever, or the 46-inch plasma herm. And, I mean, it sounds stupid as heck that these people, the cultured ancient Athenians, the people who gave us Plato and Socrates, had these doogies in front of their houses, but they did. It was a fertility symbol. stood for being real, real, real fertile. Alcibiades and his buddies went out, supposedly, they and yes, ma'am. Not chopped them, just broke them off, kicked them off, snapped them off. They're not attached anymore. They are no longer attached anymore. Aromatized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, bobatized them. Next morning, Transported. no, now that's a little, girls, that's a little <laughs> bit farther south, okay? Um, well, here's the point. It's like a good luck charm. They broke the doogies off, and then they all shuffle onto the boats, all hanging over the next morning, and they go off to invade Sicily. Word got out that Alcibiades, the admiral of the Greek Athenian fleet, had out been, been breaking on doogies the night before. Not only is this bad luck, it's even illegal. So they send a police boat after him. Pardon? Uh, they don't know. 
because they never caught him, you know. What he did was he found out the boat was coming and he jumped ship and defected to Sparta. He changed sides, carrying a complete set of the Athenian battle plans. Okay, it's as if um, you know, John F. Kennedy said, I'm sick and tired of being an American and all that. I want to drink vodka and wrestle with bears, which are very popular pastimes in Russia. Um, and so he became, becomes Ivan Kennedov. Okay? I mean, it just doesn't happen. All right? It's like watching Pat Boone rap. There is a Pat Boone heavy metal album out there. And hell, there's even a video of North Korean kids playing Take On Me on accordions. You haven't lived till you've seen that. But here's my point. Alcibiades defected. The Athenians go over there anyway, and they get their butts kicked. The Athenian expedition completely defeated. The Spartans spend, say, the next 10 years just running rampant through ancient Greece and laying siege, to At laying siege to Athens. And you just know that Bubacus and Jethra in the Athenian city are saying, I told you, when they broke the doogies off the sacred images of Hermes, I could have told you we was going to lose. And lose they did. It's 4.06, not in the afternoon, you just wish it were. It's 406 B.C., and the Athenians are in what Everett McGill would call a tight spot. There's Spartans all over the place. Their navy is trashed. They got no money. It's looking pretty grim. They could use a few laughs. I wouldn't say that the ancient Athenians of the 5th century B.C. invented comedy. Comedy like tragedy, came out, started out as just a chorus, singing and dancing around. Kind of like on that god-awful thing at halftime of the Super Bowl game, where this 72-year-old woman named Madonna <laughs> is dancing around with all these buff young people and stuff like that with M's written all over them, doing their old songs from when hardly anybody except for me was even alive. She was killing something. She was killing my ears. I know that much. I actually, I, I, I just hit the mute button and watched in mute stupefaction. Just like, good Lord. At least there were no wardrobe malfunctions. Thank you, Fluffy. I know. Eventually, they had a guy who came on and did a little spoken word poetry while everybody danced. This guy was called the Hippocrates, the answerer. It's also the Greek word for actor. The person who came out and spoke while everybody else danced was the first actor. The ancient Greeks liked this idea. Pretty soon, they got as many as three people up on the stage. They always kept the chorus dancing around and commenting, but instead of the focus being on the singers and dancers, the focus shifted to the people who spoke. When they talked about serious affairs like Prometheus, you know, being stuck up on that rock with a gutter eagle eating his gizzard every day because he's the only person who knows the one girl that Zeus cannot have sex with, that's tragedy. When Antigone is told, your older brother of your two brothers is to be buried with full honors because he died in defense of his country, while the younger of your two brothers is to be maggot bait, just lie out there and rot because he fought invading the city. That's tragedy. That's Antigone deciding to say, they're both my brothers. I don't care about your stupid law. They're both my brothers. One's buried, the other's not. I'm their sister. I'm going to bury them both. That's tragedy. Comedy is just a bunch of goofy crap. Like when they decided in 406 B.C. that, geez, Aeschylus just died. Bummer. 
Euripides just died. Bummer. Aristophanes, the comedian, thinks, I'm going to write a play about how we have to send somebody on a catabasis because catabasis is really funny. You know, dying people, you know, eternal misery, no point to living and stuff like that. Just as an aside, how many of you ever saw a play or a movie called The Producers? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's basically you take the worst possible premise for a play, and hopefully you will lose a lot of money on it for tax purposes, so you come up with a play about Hitler. Hitler. For Hitler in Germany. It's kind of like that. Aristophanes decides that he is going to send Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine and partying, down to the underworld to bring back a great poet. One of the two, Aeschylus or Euripides, who can help Athens through their time of woe. They're about to get their tails handed to them by the Spartans. And actually in 403 B.C. or some other year, the Spartans do come in there and just turn Athens into a parking lot. It's like knowing that the semester or the quarter is over, you got a really bad report card, but you're praying for the high school to burn down, so before it gets mailed, don't laugh. I've been there. <laughs> And that's my point exactly. It's the same thing about the frogs. It's really a bad time in Athenian history. Something fecal is about to hit the fan, and it's going to stink and fly all over the place. The Spartans hate us, and there are more of them than there are of us. They're going to come in here and waste us and kill a lot of us and stuff like that. God, I could use a few laughs. And when you need to laugh in the worst possible way, the answer is Aristophanes. If I were to get a chance to talk to one person in all classical antiquity, it would be Aristophanes because the guy just makes me laugh. What he's going to do, and I'll pause for a second, is take the conventions of the catabasis, a hero who makes a descent to the underworld. He gets to see all the traditional features of the underworld, see all sorts of dead people, He's going to hopefully gain some wisdom from this competition between the two poets, and he's going to return, making not only his life better, but all of Athens' life better by bringing them the kind of poet who can actually help them in these tough times. Okay, Camille, you're yawning. I don't blame you. I've been talking a lot. Are you all familiar now? hopefully with what the background of the play is. Dionysus has to go down and bring back a good poet. Here's a question. Speaking of dead rock stars or dead poets or stuff like that, raise your hand. Please don't blurt. If you would, you could go down to Hades and bring back a dead rock star or a dead author. Who would you bring? Sam? I've got a list. No, one. I'm making it... Okay, anybody else? Who said Bob Marley? Me. Got Bob Marley. Bob Marley, John Lennon. Who? Jimmy Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Not bad. So far I'm voting for Jimmy. Anybody else? You know, Pardon? You know, they count. Your name is? Dan. Dan. Bon Scott. Okay. Why? Well, no, I mean, his great achievement was what, to drink himself to death? I tried that once, and I failed. Here I am. Okay, what kind of achievement is that? Stop. Whereas Bob made us all love each other, you know. John Lennon, well, I'm no fan, but I know a lot of people who are. Okay, no argument there. Who else do we have? Hendrix. He taught, the world, he taught Bob Dylan how to play all along the watchtower. Okay, who else? Did cult, you know, okay, I'm desperate. I'll take Freddie. Ray Charles. Ray Charles. Yes. Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain. I'll take that. Don't agree. I'll take that. No. No. no, but what we could do is we could put Adele 
on the cosmic scales of truth with Amy Whitehouse. And I mean, Whitehouse, and I know it would be kind of funny because as a white-o American, you know, I'm rooting for Adele, okay? Although if I ever hear another one of her songs while I'm trying to work out, I may kill somebody, and you'll read about me in the newspaper. It's not that they're bad. I hear them all the time. It, oh, I know, but they always do. They've done that since the dawn of time, since I was young. And then there's poor little skinny Amy. Okay, you know. Okay, you got one for me, Devi? Definitely. Elena? You're, no, you're Elena. You're Elena. Then, then who are you? You're Becky. Okay, today you're Becky. Go ahead today, Becky. <laughs> I turned into a burning ring of fire. I'll take Johnny. He's the man in black. He kicked ass. Your name is? Jack. Jack? Biggie Smalls. Yeah. Biggie Smalls? Yeah. I'm old. Tell me who he is. You know who he is, Rich? Okay. Okay. Now, here's my question. What great redeeming benefit would he bring to humanity if he were alive again? Well, see, now, if, 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 well, that's a good, you kind of got me with that one. Because I was thinking, like, Freddie Mercury. I mean, he had these great big, huge teeth and the bungee jumping mustache and stuff like that. And one thing I will remember, I do remember about Freddie is that um, when, you know, I'm so old, I came out, I, I heard Bohemian Rhapsody when it was new. I drove around in cars and heard it on the radio. And there were people who were saying, hey, I heard that Freddie Mercury is gay. <laughs> but, but this is 1976. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, I heard that Elton John might be Okay, too. It's like, oh, I mean, you know that, and I know that, but I mean, like, who next? Liberace? <laughs> Adam Lambert? Oh no! Katie Lang is gay. Oh my God! Wow, I did not know that. Well, I knew it would shock you. My point is that people would say, "Well, wait a minute. If Freddie Mercury is gay." then that's an example of a gay person who is just really awesome and cool. And people start saying, well, okay, who cares what Freddie does in his spare time? He's, the sing he's Freddie effing Mercury, the singer of Bohemian Rhapsody, one of like the three coolest songs in the whole world. Pardon? So I would say Freddie would bring some redeeming virtue. Bon Scott, did you figure out anything yet? No, he, the blues never left. Okay, any other people? Okay. Okay. Camille? Frank Zappa. Yes, I was going to say that. Yeah, well, I would bring back Frank Zappa. What's that? A A L I Y A H. She died in a tragic plane accident. Okay, and that would be a redeeming social benefit in my viewpoint. <laughs> Not hating, haters are going to hate. My point is this. <laughs> I asked you kids to bring back a singer or, you know, musical type person who was really great and would make an awesome difference in today's world, and I got some good ones. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, Frank Zappa, Bon Scott, who else? I'll, this is the last call. Go ahead, Bethany. I say yes. There's still a question that he's even there. <laughs> no, Elvis is everywhere. Elvis is everything. Elvis is still alive. Elvis is still the king. Okay, here's a question. Here's a question. Here's a question. I would even give you this on a test, but not you because you're just watching this on iTunes. This is just for me and my real life flesh and blood students goes like this. John Lennon or Elvis? How many of you want to pass this class? Let's try that again. John Lennon or Elvis? John Lennon or the king of rock and roll? 
this woman flat out gets it, okay? No, he's not. Um, and Michael Jackson is a king of pop, so he's in heaven anyway. But yeah, Elvis or the Beatles? Beatles. Elvis! Beatles! Does nobody want to stick up for the king of rock and roll? Okay, raise your hand if you love Elvis more than the Beatles. Raise your hand if you're one of the benighted souls with no taste in music, who don't really care whether you pass my class or not. Bill who? Bill Beckham Jordan Carter. Pardon? I said Bill Beckham Jordan Carter, the ultimate biggest fan. I said it was a problem. George is my doppelganger. George <laughs> and I want, and you can ask me if this is true. We were going to a convention in San Diego. We're walking through the um, Denver airport, the old Denver airport, and we saw Madeline Albright. And she said, Joe, how are you doing? I said, hey, who's that guy? Of course, George will tell you that. She said, hey, George, how are you doing? Who's that guy? George is my old buddy. He wears, still wears wooden neckties from time to time. He needs to get alive. And see, that's his penance. They made him a department head. Whereas <laughs> I get to have fun. But you also like Elvis, so the point is made. See, that hunter is kind of like the difference between Aeschylus and Euripides. I knew that if I probed and prodded and kicked and pulled and tugged, I could get you mad enough to say mean things about me, all of which I remember. <laughs> along with the name of the person who saved them, and I'm going to go run down the, run down the book of bad people. But it's going to end with that. The play is going to end with Elvis or the Beatles, Bon Scott or Aaliyah. 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 Sorry. Sammy. Is Elvis going to be on the One of the reasons why people try to say that Elvis still is alive is, I think, to suggest that it's kind of like Elvis has just gone on a catabasis to gain wisdom. Elvis is, I'm sorry, <coughs> was a spiritual seeker. Elvis used to wear around his neck a Mogan David, a crescent, and a cross because he used to say, I ain't going to be kept out of heaven on no technicality. <laughs> or maybe not. Okay, other questions. Go ahead, Dubai. Why Dionysus? Uh, of all the people, gods, Dionysus. Okay, I'm going to put my legs on this chair here so you ladies cannot be distracted from my teaching. <laughs> like it's going to be funny because it's really funny. Number one, it's Dionysus' festival. The comedies were held at the festival of Dionysus. That's one thing, okay? So, why not? And number two, I mean, Dionysus. I mean, you said he has a body like a Greek god. Do you expect some like androgynous little purple guy who looks like an ancient Greek version of Prince? <laughs> I think Prince is Dionysus. I think Dionysus is Prince, little purple guy. You don't know if he's a girl or a guy, and he's going, ah, ah, you know, and stuff like that. He's perfect. I, I mean, it, it, it's, oh, great fluffy. Now do you got some prints in your head? Yes. See, thank me. That's much, 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 much better. <laughs> I think the movie Purple Rain is a, just an ultimate catabasis movie, by the way. My point is this. Dionysus is the excellent choice because he's the god of wine and festive, and because he's a god. If he's a god, we would think, wouldn't we, that Dionysus here, Oh, come on in, your godship. It doesn't work that way at all. He's got to make the catabatic journey, and he does it in really bad style. Dionysus has to go on catabasis. First of all, he gets a wise guy slave named Exanthius. Okay? He's the sidekick, he's a twit. You know, his idea, his job, Exanthius' job is to make bad jokes while Dionysus, kind of like Brave Sir Robin, 
in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. How many of you know about Brave Sir Robin? Sir Robin ran away early in the adventure. That's correct. When danger reared his its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail and fled. And then Sir Robin says, hey, you're not supposed to be... And then the singer also sings about how he was torn into bits and eaten. And that's what Xanthius' job is. That is not an invention of Monty Python. The Greeks were doing that kind of stuff. And then Dionysus goes to Hercules, who is, of course, his half-brother. Again, we would assume that Dionysus would say, Hey, Herc. Hey, Dio. How's it going? Knock up any mortal women lately. <laughs> um, no. And Dionysus says, Heracles, I understand that um, you've gone to the underworld. Yes, I have. My last labor was a catabasis. I went down there and took Cerberus, the three-headed hound of hell, and brought him back to ancient Greece. Well, okay, and Hercules is looking all buff and handsome and kind of like flexing and crap like that. And then you got this little guy who looks like Prince, except for he's not cool. He's a little purple guy, wearing fruit on his head and holding a bottle of MD 2020 because he's the god of wine. And he says, how exactly, Herc, do I get to the wow, underworld? Adam Lambert, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Lambert playing Dionysus. Heracles being played by some muscle-bound thug. Claudius. Armand Hammer. Who? Armand Hammer. Yes, I agree with her. <laughs> well, there used to be an Armand Hammer. I mean, would Army Hammer... Ladies, you got to pick. Well, no, I know that... You know, you, The Rock. There we go. The Rock is Hercules. I have to go to the underworld. How do I go there? And, um, you know, playing up every single stereotype in the book. Aristophanes made fun of absolutely shh, everybody equally. Straight people, gay people, men women, Greeks, barbarians, himself, he had a receding hairline, like me, and made bald jokes all the damn time. I mean, he would even make pedophile jokes, like, because it was kind of considered okay for an older Greek man to like boys who were about 9, 10, 11, 12. I'm not supporting that. I think it was crap. I think it was a basically effed up system. I don't have any problem with two gay guys getting married and adopting a family of 57 kids. I just don't care. It is kind of warped when it's one's a kid and the other's a grown up, no matter what gender. But Aristophanes said, well, this is all well and good. My son was walking by your house last night and you didn't even fondle his testicles. <laughs> this guy would say or do anything for a joke. So when um, Adam Lambert, who is a, one of the stars of the former, sh what was the name of that stupid crap reality show he was on? Or Contest of the Talent List. What did he win? American something? Okay, American Idol was a TV show that ran too long and catapulted all sorts of nobodies to stardom. And this one was the flamboyant gay star as opposed to the country and western star as opposed to the guy with cute hair, as opposed to the guy from Springfield, Missouri. He was The Bachelor. <laughs> Keep it all your reality shit. No. no. Um, Heracles says, well, you see that tower up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you climb up to the top of that tower, Dionysus, yeah, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then you go up to the top of the tower and you look out over the edge of the tower. Yeah, okay. And you look down and you see the torch race getting ready to start. Yeah, yeah, I love the torch race. Yeah, what do I do then? Well, you know, when the guy who starts the torch race says, okay, go, yeah, you go. Oh, no, I smacked my little brains out. 
I passed for a joke in ancient Greece. He's a god, and he's supposed to um, <clears throat> worry about dying. I'm not going to give the rest of the way because I think I've given you enough of a background to make some sense out of the whole play now, or at least I hope I have. I want you to have read the entire play by our next exciting reading with the understanding that I will not expect you to understand why Euripides and Aeschylus can't agree with each other. I mean, if you like that sort of stuff like me and Hunter, you know, cool. I do want you to understand, think of the um, topography of the underworld. What happens when you see the boatman Charon of the underworld? You know, is he a nice guy? Is he a happy guy? What is the purpose of the frogs besides singing brekka kex coax coax? Okay, what are the frogs doing there? Um, what is the river like that surrounds the underworld? What kind of people are there down there in the underworld? What kind of monsters? What are the judges like? And of course, your questions. Okay. I pause for your questions about the frogs. I pause for your questions about anything I've said during today's award-winning class. Divide. Um, the study guide. I have not composed that yet because a lot of it's going to depend on what we do with it. Okay, Taylor? What's the guy's name again? Um, how did he get, did he get chosen to make that happen or feel better or like what? Well, okay, I'll tell you this. It's off the record. You can leave your books in your backpacks. This will be an act, uh, a little bonus. I know, I'm going to reward you with a bonus lecture. It's going to be a real short one. It goes like this. The city of ancient Greece that is closest to Athens is called Thebes. Because 90% of the surviving ancient Greek literature was written by people from Athens or people who like to suck up to Athens or wish they were in Athens, Athens is always going to look good and Thebes is always going to look bad. Growing up in Wisconsin, we had a name for people from Illinois, Fibs. Effing Illinois bees. They called us cheeseheads. We all told Iowa jokes together, the only state where the cheerleaders go out on the field to graze at halftime. Here in Missouri, it's popular to tell Arkansas jokes or Kansas jokes. Kansas is good for sunflowers, sunshine, and sons of, yeah. I'm just saying that that's what you're, you say about your neighbors. Thebes gets a bum rap. So one day there was this princess of Thebes named Semele. She was cute. And Zeus came to her and mingled in love with her and got her pregnant because once he turned loose to Zeus, the women do. Um, Zeus just has womb envy. Here's what happens. The girl, Semele, who is going to be Dionysus' mom, gets pregnant. And Zeus actually comes back to visit her on occasion, which is very un-Zeus-like, because Zeus is more the use him, abuse him, and lose him type. So Semele started, I have got it on with Zeus. And she tells this old bag lady, hey, old bag lady, you know who I got it going with? Zeus. The bag lady is Hera in disguise. And she says, well, how do you know, young lady, that a Zeus you slept with? I mean, you know, lots of guys say they're Zeus. Oh, no, he really was Zeus. <laughs> Tell him to prove it. And then the girl starts to have some doubts. And basically, the old bag lady says, Tell him to reveal himself to you in his full Zeusliness the way that he does when he makes love with his lawfully wedded wife, the great goddess Hera. Can you remember all that? <laughs> and she does. I mean, you know, Semele and Zeus have sex, and she says, Oh, by the way, I want to make sure you're Zeus, so please reveal yourself to me in your full Zeusliness the way you do when you make love with your lawfully wedded wife, the great and powerful and beautiful goddess Hera. I'll do anything for love, says Zeus. 
but I won't do that. <laughs> because my Zeus lateness is too much for you. You don't love me, and you think I'm fat. So he has to <laughs> reveal himself into his, his full Zeusliness and immediately fries her to a crisp. A pile of ashes. A pregnant pile of ashes. He reaches down into the smoldering heap of ashes and pulls out the fetus. And then he remembers, oh yeah, I'm a guy, put it in my thigh so he doesn't die. <laughs> I ought to be fired for that. Bleep out the taking of our Savior's name in vain, but leave the dance. <laughs> I felt it for a second. He carries Dionysus around in his thigh, and then he finally like spoops him up to be raised by nymphs and satyrs. Why not? Nymphs are semi-divine female creatures who just want to party all the time. Satyrs are semi-divine male creatures who just want to party all the time, which is why they hook up with the nymphs. And the nymphs and the satyrs are getting drunk and just having a really grand old party. And Precisely. So that's why Dionysus, what was your question? What was your question? How Dionysus got to cheering up the Athens because they were losing so bad. Because again, you could send Her Hercules, but it wouldn't be funny. You could send Hephaestus, the limping god of metal shop. It would be funny for like the first five minutes, kind of like almost every Will Ferrell movie that's not Anchorman. Old school is also good. But my point is that you want, you really need to laugh, right? So you got to pull out the heavy artillery. And who better than the somewhat androgynous, drunken god whose festival it happens to be. How's that? I'm sticking to it. It's kind of like drag, okay? Why do the British like to be in drag? Like uh, Eddie Izzard, right? Why does he wear drag? I know, but it, the, I mean, what's the point? British have drag races. It's like we only have one good drag queen in the whole country. That's correct. RuPaul, hero of the drag races. If I had to design a catabasis, if I were going to make a catabasis hero movie that was funny, RuPaul would be in it. I like that idea. He would be bringing back either Divine or Andy Warhol. Okay, how's that for avant-garde? I don't know. That's what I got for you today. Any more questions? Sorry, no more question. Get out of here. I'll see you next time. Read the dang frogs.